I was weak and weary. I had gone astray, walking in the darkness. I could not find my way. And then a light came shining to lead me from despair. All my sins forgiven, and I was free from care. I found the answer. I learned to pray with faith to guide me. Oh, I found a way. And now the sun is shining for me each day. Yes, I found the answer when I learned to pray. I was sad and lonely All my hope was gone Days were long and dreary I could not carry on And then a light came shining To lead me from despair All again my sin once again I'm happy and here's the reason why I found the answer oh I learned to pray with faith to guide me oh I glad learned to pray and now the sun is shining long and dreary I could not carry on and then I found the courage to lead me from despair and once again I'm happy and this is the reason why I found the answer your blessings and always stop to pray learn to keep on believing and faith will see you through seek to know contentment and it will come to you I learned.
Now that's the second time I've heard uh, Vernetta sing that song. And uh, I think it gets better every time I hear it. Amen. Really enjoy that. Well, uh, I'm here to report uh, back to you after being in Texas, in California. Um, Texas was kind of what I expected, very flat. Um, I did notice on the campus of Southwestern Adventist University, almost everywhere you look, it had signs for a storm shelter. I asked one of the kids there, I said, do you guys use these very often? He said, eh, not too often. <laughs> but uh, obviously they have a lot of bad storms there. And of course, then I went to California. Um, no offense, Mel. <laughs> I was a little disillusioned. Um, I was in Southern California, to be fair. Melanie lives in Northern, or is from Northern California. But um, Southern California uh, was very desert-like. And uh, it's very flat, but all of a sudden there's a huge mountain coming out of nowhere. And uh, everything was kind of brown. And, you know, the grass was withered and everything. They said it gets very hot there. But all in all, it was a good trip. We went through Hollywood and saw that. Um, again, a little disillusion. Graffiti all over the place and um, just not exactly what I was expecting. I thought it was going to be just so pristine and nice. Not so. Um, but all in all, it was, it's a nice place. Nice people out there. Um, at least the ones I ran into and had a great time. My sermon title for today is, God Notices When We Thank Him. I mean, come on, what do you think I'm going to preach about? It's Thanksgiving week, right? And we've got to preach about thanking God. Amen. For most of us, when we think of Thanksgiving, we think of the inhabitants of Plymouth Colony. There were a group of English Protestants who wanted to separate from the Church of England. We called them pilgrims. And when you realize that they lost half of the original number trying to make it through the first winter, it's no surprise that they were primed for a celebration when there was a great har harvest the following autumn. They couldn't celebrate alone though. They had to invite their friends. They had to invite the Wampanoag Indians. Because the Indians, you see, had helped them to learn how to fish, how to plant, and how to hunt. So by the autumn of 1621, a joyous celebration was held at Plymouth. It's in our modern day Massachusetts. Pilgrim and Indian came together to celebrate the abundant harvest that they had enjoyed. Now their meal, it's very interesting, there was no turkey there for all you turkey lovers. It consisted of deer, corn, shellfish, and roasted goose, we believe. They celebrated with singing and dancing playing games because they knew that they had enough food to make it through that winter. And that was big stuff. The Puritans came along a little later and they celebrated Thanksgiving a little differently. A little differently. For them, it was a time of fasting and prayer. No feasting, it was a time of fasting and prayer. And of course, as time went on, various states began to celebrate the holiday, but on varying dates. Until this lady, Sarah Josepha Hale, I think I got her middle name right, Josepha, never heard that before, began writing letters to President Abraham Lincoln asking him to recognize this as a national holiday. Well, President Lincoln apparently saw the virtue in it because in 1863, four months after his victory at Gettysburg, he signed that into a national holiday. He said the fourth, the last Thursday of November was going to be Thanksgiving Day. Now for many, Thanksgiving Day is a day to enjoy good food, family and friends. And if you're so inclined, maybe even a little football. I personally think Thanksgiving is one of the best holidays of the year. It's probably one of the least commercialized unless you go to the day after. <laughs> And then, uh, forget about that. You know, my family and I had the best Thanksgiving dinner. We had tofurkeys. Sorry, guys. Uh, imitation turkey. It's fantastic. You ought to try it if you haven't. We had green bean casserole, macaroni and cheese, mashed potatoes, corn, sweet potatoes, crescent rolls, chocolate pie, 
decaffeinated sweet tea, and the list goes on and on and on. Man, I'm, I've got to stop. You guys are going to get up and run downstairs. <laughs> but I prayed before we tore into all that food. I thanked God for the blessings. I, in fact, I said an extended prayer. I made it longer than normal. And actually, my parents ended up spending the rest of the afternoon with us in that evening, which all told made it an incredible day. A fantastic day. But every year at some point, I'm always hit with the conviction, this is a holiday to praise God, and yet, God isn't so much in it. I mean, yeah, we thank Him, we praise, uh, praise His name before we eat, and we'll say a few nice things about what He's done for us throughout the year, but most of the day is about us. <laughs> it's about me and my family, and spending time together, and enjoying, enjoying ourselves. Maybe the Puritans had it right. Maybe it should be a, a day of fasting and prayer. So I tell you what, next Thanksgiving, let's all make it a day of fasting and prayer. What do you think? No feasting, no socializing, fasting and prayer. Are you with me? Yeah. Nah, I didn't think he was good for it. <laughs> but listen, however you or I celebrate Thanksgiving, the fact remains that giving thanks to God is not only good and right, it's essential. It's essential. Amen? Amen? This morning we will see that God notices when we thank Him. Spending plenty of time thanking God and praising God must become a regular part of our walk with Him. Our relationship with Him. How often, now be honest with me for a minute. Matter of fact, you don't even have to say it out loud. Just think it in your mind. How often do you get down on your knees and spend time doing nothing else but praising God. Not asking for anything. Just praising Him. For half an hour, say. How, how often do I do that? Praising God. Thanking God is powerful business. Powerful business. So this morning, I want to study a passage that drives that point home. Please take out your Bibles, as always, and we're going to turn to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. We're going to be looking at verse 11. But you know what we got to do before we go there? We have to pray. In fact, I wouldn't think of starting without praying. Luke chapter 17 and verse 11. Let's bow our heads and say a word of prayer. Lord God, this morning, once again, we ask and pray for the Holy Spirit to be here in our midst, in our hearts. We're going to open your word. And Lord, we know this word... It was inspired by you. And so, Lord, bring to our understanding what you would. May we not just be hearers of the word, but also doers of the word as well. In the name of Jesus, all the people said, Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 17. Let's look at verses 11 through 13. Now it happened, as he, Jesus, went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. <coughs> Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood, what church? Afar off. And they lifted their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Jesus and his disciples were traveling along and as often was the case, he was teaching them as they were walking together. Wouldn't you like to have that happen? Jesus teaching you as you're taking a walk with him? Go to heaven and you'll get to do that, I'm sure. As he's teaching them, they come upon ten lepers. Now the ten lepers in chapter 17 are very similar to the single leper, or the one leper, in Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. In that instance, Christ, this leper comes to Christ and he says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. In other words, heal me. Jesus did the unthinkable. He walked over, placed his hands on that leper, and said, I am willing, be clean. And the man was healed. Now, we don't have to deal with leprosy very much today, praise God. I was told by someone at the other church, I did the same message over there, and he said, they call it Hansen's disease today. I'd never heard that before. I guess he's right. If you're in the medical profession, maybe you know. But uh, we don't have to deal with that too much. But a person with leprosy, especially back in Bible times, would die a slow, painful death. 
Their flesh would literally rot off of their body. Hands and limbs would fall off over time. Leprosy was the most dreaded disease you could get. Because it wasn't only a slow, painful death, it was also a social death. You had to immediately separate yourself from your loved ones, from your family, your mother, your father, your wife, your kids, your home, your church. You had to move and live outside the city. Leviticus 13 tells us all about this. It says, Now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn, and his head shall be bare, and he shall cover his mustache, and cry, Unclean, unclean. I freak out a little bit when I see people walking around with those things on their, you know, at the airport and stuff. I see that all the time, and I'm like, Oh, what do they got? You know? <laughs> Imagine walking out into public and crying, Unclean, unclean, covering yourself up like that. A modern day equivalent would be someone diagnosed possibly with HIV or AIDS. Maybe especially when it first came out years ago. I don't know if I told you about that or not. But I remember getting dispatched to a call for a gentleman um, who was reporting vandalism. I went to his house. Very nice house. I mean a big house. Fancy house. I went to the house and before I even got up on the door he was in the doorway and he looked rough. He looked like he just climbed out of bed. His shirt was unbuttoned. His hair was all messed up. He invited me on in. I came on into the house. We went into the living room and there was a couch and a chair. But there was also a hospital bed. And I was like, whoa, something's, somebody's sick. Then I looked a little more and I noticed a nightstand sitting right next to the hospital bed with 40 or 50 medicine bottles on it. Tons of medicine, but I was like, whoa, somebody is sick around here. Which, of course, always makes you a little antsy. And then a few minutes later, he confirmed it. He said, I think this incident happened as a result of discrimination. And I said, discrimination? He said, yeah, discrimination against HIV and AIDS. So, like, whoa. That was the first time that I had been around somebody that I knew was infected with the disease. Now, I've got to tell you, I've had... I'd had bloodborne pathogen training, but it made me a little nervous. It made me just a little bit nervous. But I went out of my way to take extra time and stay there with that man and let him know that he was more important than my fear of his disease. I wanted him to know that I cared about him and I cared about what he was going through. Like the lepers of old, that guy felt, I'm sure, isolated. His mom was there, and his mom explained to me how all, his, all of his friends had abandoned him once he received that diagnosis. Nobody would associate with him. He was all alone. But you see, leprosy was even worse because you couldn't even have your mom there. You couldn't have your dad there. You couldn't have nobody there. Unless they were also a leper. Jesus and his disciples came upon these ten lepers who had joined together to try and bring each other comfort. I mean, even lepers need somebody to talk to. Even lepers need somebody to love them, to share with. When you're rejected by everyone, you'll take whatever you can get. It doesn't matter what nationality another leper was. It doesn't matter what political party they subscribed to. It doesn't matter how they voted in the presidential election. It didn't matter any of that stuff. They were lepers. They had no body except each other. And they had come together for comfort and support. As soon as those lepers saw Jesus and his disciples, they began to cry out. They began to cry out with everything they had left in them. There were ten men, but they cried out with one voice. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Notice it wasn't Jesus heal us. Jesus come see us. It was have mercy on us. You see, I believe they realized that this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. To not only be healed from a terrible disease, but to possibly get their lives back. Notice the Bible doesn't record them covering their mustaches. Doesn't record them yelling unclean, but rather, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They simply asked for Jesus to have mercy. 
But you know, that's awesome about Jesus. He can read your heart. He knows what's going on in there. He knew about the pain and anguish those men had endured for years. For years, people had gasped when they seen him. <gasps> had run the other way. Children probably screamed as they saw discolored flesh. Missing arms and legs. Missing hands and feet. Bandages all over the place. See, Jesus was the only hope those lepers had. He was it. And they weren't going to let him pass by without crying and begging and pleading for mercy. They asked for mercy because they couldn't find it from anyone else. Maybe those lepers had heard that Jesus will not turn away, will not turn away the one who asked with a sincere heart. He didn't turn them away. He won't turn you away. And he won't turn me away. Those lepers, I believe, though, had an advantage over you and I. An advantage? You say, Mike, are you nuts? They had leprosy. No, but listen to me. They realized that Jesus was all they had. They were at rock bottom. All they could do was go up. You see, you and I sometimes still have some self-confidence in us. We still believe we can do something at times to help ourselves. We still believe that our friends, our family can help us. But these lepers only had Jesus. Look at verses 14 through 16. Verses 14 through 16. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priest. And so it was as they went... They were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice did what, church? Glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was who? A Samaritan of all people. Now with men in such a poor condition, you might expect that Christ would act very similar to what happened in Luke 5. He would go over and touch them Maybe embrace them. But he doesn't do that at all. All he says is, go show yourself to the priest. But that was more than enough. You see, the lepers understood that the priests were the ones who would examine you. If you had a funny looking spot on your arm that was discolored, they would check it out. They would do certain things to see if that was leprosy or not. By saying, go show yourselves to the priest, Christ was implying... That their condition would be different when they got there. They realized there was promise in his words. They knew what he meant. The priest could determine them to still have leprosy or be leprosy free. And Christ could have said, I am willing, be healed. And the same result would have occurred. By saying, go show yourself to the priest, he was implying... That things were going to be different. Things were going to change. Those men may have started their journey with leprosy, but they had faith to believe that it wasn't going to end that way. They took Jesus at his word, and as they went, their leprosy disappeared. I can imagine them, one of them hobbling on a stub where a diseased foot had been. And the next thing you know, he breaks into a run with perfectly healthy legs and feet. I can imagine another one, maybe a few others, swinging what used to be an arm. Just a small portion of it left. And suddenly, their entire arm and hand is restored. Just like it was before. What an exhilarating feeling that must have been. I'm sure their minds were racing. Oh, I'm going to go to the priest. I'm going to run to my family. Or maybe I'm going to go to my family first, and then I'll go to the priest. No, no, no. I better go to the priest first. They were excited. There's a story of a man named Terry Wallace who just celebrated the birth of his daughter. And he was involved in a terrible motor vehicle accident. In fact, the accident was so bad it left him in a coma. He wasn't in a coma for just a day or a week. But for 19 years, he was in a coma. The doctors told his family he probably would never wake up. And then it happened. 
His mother happened to go to the rehabilitation center where he had been spending a lot of that, those 19 years. She just happened to be in for a visit one day. And without warning, all of a sudden he woke up and got his life back. Now, sure, he had physical damage and permanent damage from the accident that was never going to go away. But he got to go home and for the first time meet his 19-year-old daughter. I think that man knows something of how those lepers felt when Christ gave them their lives back. They got to go home and see their kids once again. It's funny. That man, when he woke up, his mother asked him who the president was and he said, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> he was still living 19 years ago. Had to be brought up to the times. Those men didn't just want their health back. They wanted their lives back. They could once again embrace their wives and children. They could walk down the street without people gasping and running in the other direction. They could go into their homes again and sleep. They could worship again just like everybody else. It was almost too good to be true, but it was true. And as awesome as that time was for those lepers, they completely and totally forgot all about the one who made it all possible. They forgot that one moment they had no life and for all intents and purposes were dead. And the next moment they were healed and restored, running back to their lives once again. All they could think about was themselves. Jesus faded into the back of their mind somewhere. I mean, yeah, they were obedient. Christ did tell them to go show themselves to the priest, and that's what they were doing. But what about gratitude? What about saying thank you? Praise God, there was one. There was one man who had to come back. He had to come back. And when he came back, he fell down at Jesus' feet. Not just falling at his feet, he put his face to the ground. And said, thank you, God. Thank you for what you've done. Ten men had been healed. But only one come back and came back and thanked God. You know, many times I've asked God for blessings in my life and he comes through. He answers my request. But on more than one occasion, kind of embarrassed to admit this, sometimes hours later, sometimes days later, I realize I never said thank you. Oh Lord God, forgive me. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you. So let me ask you, church, do you thank God? Do you praise Him? Do we all praise Him with the same intensity that we make our request with? Offering up heartfelt thanks to God is vitally important for those who are following Christ. It affects every area of our walk with Him. In our passage, to add insult to injury, the one had been leper that came back was a Samaritan. <laughs> A Samaritan of all people. The Jews hated Samaritans. The other nine guys, those other nine dudes were Jews. And they were nowhere to be found. You see, the Jews accused the Samaritans of compromising in the true worship of God. They didn't want to be around them. They didn't want to touch them. They didn't want to associate in any way. But the one who came back and truly worshipped God was a Samaritan. Listen, our giving thanks, our offering praise to God is of paramount importance. It really does matter to Him. We take a lot for granted. But praising God is serious business. Do you think He doesn't notice when we don't say thank you? Do you think He doesn't notice when we don't praise Him? Yes, He notices. It does make a difference in more ways than one. Look at verses 17 through 19. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. You know, I'm trying to teach Jewel right now. 
praise God, to thank God. And usually when we're going to pray, I'll always ask her, hey, what are we going to pray about? Miss Jeannie will like this one. She'll usually say, help me to be a good girl at school. <laughs> and I'll say, that's an important one. <laughs> we definitely want to pray about that. But we also need to think about what we're going to praise him for and thank him for. And so we'll start into a list. Well, we want to thank him for mommy and daddy. We want to thank him for... Um, all our toys. We want to thank him for this and we want to thank him for the grandparents and, and we want to thank him for that. And then she'll pray and I'll pray. But what I'm trying to teach her is this. To begin her prayers with thanksgiving to God and end her prayers with thanksgiving to God. Don't make your prayer life all about request. <laughs> Giving thanks to Christ matters. Giving thanks to God matters. Giving thanks to the Holy Spirit matters. Jesus rhetorically asked, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? I mean, all ten men had received the same exact gift. They were restored in the same way, but only one had time to show gratitude to God. So let me ask you, church, why do we need to thank God? I mean... <laughs> Isn't it true that he can read the thoughts and intents of our heart? Doesn't he know when I'm really thankful and when I'm not? I mean, why do I even need to say it? He knows when I appreciate something, doesn't he? Check this out. Desire of Ages, page 348. The Lord conti works continually to benefit mankind. He is ever imparting his bounties. He raises up the sick from beds of languishing. He delivers men from peril which they do not see. He commissions heavenly angels to save them from calamity. To guard them from the pestilence that walketh in darkness. And the destruction that wasteth at noonday. But their hearts are what? Unimpressed. He has given all the riches of heaven to redeem them. And yet they are unmindful of his great love. By their ingratitude, they close their hearts against the grace of God. Like the heath in the desert, they know not when good cometh. And their souls inhabit the parched places of the wilderness. It is for our own benefit. Whose benefit? Our own benefit to keep every gift of God fresh in our memory. Thus faith is strengthened to claim and receive more and more. There is greater encouragement for us in the least blessing we ourselves receive from God than in all the accounts we read of the faith and experience of others. God wants us to praise Him. Amen? Amen. And it's not just for His benefit, it's for our benefit also. It changes us. It changes the way we think. It opens our hearts and opens our minds. It shows us how much God is really working in our lives. That's right. <laughs> Requesting things from God is good and right and a necessity. But if asking for things consumes most of our prayer times, we've stopped short. We've fallen short. Christ finally asked, were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Luke records the, way, the words in such a way where it almost seems as if Christ is grieved. He's grieved. I mean, not only did Jesus give those men their health and their lives back, but he was about to die for them. They couldn't take time to show gratitude for being healed. How would they ever appreciate what Christ was about to do for them on the cross? You know, it's very interesting. As I was studying this passage, I stumbled across something that I think was profound. In Luke 17, 5, go there with me real quickly. I want to show you this real fast. In Luke 17, 5... <coughs> we find the disciples making a request. What is that request? Increase our faith. They made this request right after Christ had taught them about forgiveness. He said, if a brother comes to you and sins against you seven times in a day, and then comes back seven more times and says, I'm sorry, guess what? You got to forgive him. 
And they said, oh, Lord, increase our faith. That was heavy. You've got to forgive them that much? And what happens just a short time later? In the same chapter, the ten lepers show up. The ten lepers show up. And Christ is able to teach the disciples a practical lesson on the power and the virtue of praising God, of thanking God. So let me ask you this morning, church, how's your faith? Would you like to have your faith increased? And start praising God. Start praising God. Look around at all the ways He's blessed you. Praise Him. Thank Him. Get on your knees and spend time just praising, not asking for anything. Just thanking Him. Are you struggling with temptation right now? Start praising God. Watch that temptation melt away. Watch how it changes your life. Watch the way it works. Yes, God notices when we praise Him and when we don't. My prayer for this body of believers is that praising God will become a normal part of our walk with Him. We won't just wait until the end of November. We'll do it every day of the year. It'll become a staple with our walk with God. I want to close with a story you're probably familiar with. A slave girl had been following Paul and Silas around for days. Saying, these are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim the way of salvation. And I guess finally one morning Paul got up. Maybe he was in a bad mood, I don't know. But he'd heard enough of that. So he spun around, looked her right in the eyes. He realized this was an evil spirit, by the way. And he looked her right in the eyes and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And the spirit came out. But when the girl's master realized that the spirit was gone and they couldn't keep making money, they were angry. They were furious. They grabbed Paul and Silas, dragged them to a public place to answer to the magistrates. The magistrates got fired up, angry. They had them beaten with rods and thrown in jail. And what did they do? Did they go in there and sulk all night? Did they pout and cry and say, Woe unto us. We're locked up in jail. They began praising God through prayer and song. The other prisoners in the jail must have thought they had lost their minds. I'm sure they had cuts and bruises and bleeding. Locked up in shackles. And they're singing praises to God. But guess what? Those other prisoners weren't the only one that heard. God also heard. And he sent a violent earthquake, such a great earthquake, that all the cell doors flew open. Try to tell me there's not power when you're praising God. When we thank him for all he's done, no matter what we're going through. Paul and Silas that night ended up leading the jailer and his family to Christ. And the entire family was baptized. I'll say again, Christ notices when we praise Him. And He notices when we don't. Don't under, never underestimate the power of praising God. If you're not actively and aggressively praising God, I challenge you to start today. To begin today. You know, there's a powerful song. It's an older song. It's called Praise the Lord. The lyrics, some of the lyrics go like this. Praise the Lord. He will work through those who praise Him. Praise the Lord for our God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord for the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you that they drop powerless behind you when you praise Him. James, why don't you come on up? a struggle that shatters all your dreams and your hopes have been crushed.
cruelly crushed by Satan's manifested schemes. And you feel the hope within you and the urge to run and hide. Don't let the faith you're standing in seem to disappear. Just
thank you for blessing us with Luke here in this congregation. Today is a high day in Luke's life. And Lord, we just want to pause one more time. We want to pray a prayer of dedication. We want to pray, dear Lord, as our hands are laid on him, that you would just fill him to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that his life truly will never be the same again. And I pray, Lord, that Luke, every day will offer up praises to you. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to have Luke here. We're anxious to see how you're going to grow him and build his life. And Lord, we're anxious to see how you call Luke to serve you. May we build him up in that and not ever get in the way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. All the people say.
singing give thanks you know there's nothing like spending time praising God he's done so much for each one of us let's bow our heads and thank him one more time Lord God this morning we're just grateful our hearts are overflowing for all you've done for us Lord you've given us our lives back Lord, you've forgiven our sins. You've given us salvation. You give us grace daily. Lord, thank you. I wonder today with every head bowed and every eye closed, if there's someone here who would like to raise your hand and say, I commit today to begin praising God on a more, much more intentional basis. I wonder who would say that today. Praise God. Praise God. this in the forefront of our memory. Help us to do this because it really does make a difference. It makes a difference to you and it makes a difference in our lives. We love you, Lord. We're anxious for you to come. Use us until that day. In the name of Jesus, all the people said again, Amen. Yeah.